Uh, well, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Sarah Elias Stein, the director of the Adam DB Center for Jewish Studies. And um, on behalf of the center, I'd like to welcome you to today's event. Um, we welcome today the celebration of a real UCLA Allen DVD Center product, which is a book co-edited by Leah Rose Gal and Rebecca Glassberg um, entitled The Jewish Childhood in the Muslim Mediterranean, a collection of stories curated by Leila Sebar. And I say that it is a true UCLA Allen DVD Center product because um, it, it's a marvelous thing that our center has been able to nurture this collaborative endeavor along all stages of its um, maturation. It was, I think, seeded with research grant funds from our center. Uh, Rebecca Glasper, when she was a doctoral student um, in, at this university, was supported by the center. We have Rose Gal, a faculty affiliate of our center, and it has been published in the UC Press series of uh, Luminos, edited by my colleagues Tom Kressner and uh, David Myers, which publishes um, open access and print on demand works, um, which also has a connection with the Levy Center, a, a new series, relatively new series in the area of Jewish studies. So this is really the scholarly fruition of what um, our center, and really the humanities division at large, sets out to nurture. And um, much thanks is due to the Ross Chair for supporting this endeavor for the center as a whole. Um, today's event has a number of co-sponsors, and wonderful to see colleagues and students and friends from these departments and others. The Department of European Languages and Transcultural Studies, Department of Comparative Literature, and Department of History. Um, and I want to pause to thank also the staff who um, pull off all of our events so beautifully. Um, before I move to introductions, I'm just going to urge you to silence whatever you have that makes noises. Um, and tell you that after um, our speakers are finished on the podium, they will be signing books in the back of the room, and there will be a representative from the bookstore um, facilitating sales. So I hope you can stay and get your signed copy. Um, so let me describe a bit about the book and today's speakers. Uh, a Jewish Childhood in the Muslim Mediterranean brings together uh, the fascinating personal stories of writers and scholars and intellectuals, Jewish who came of age in lands where Islam was the dominant religion and where everyday life was infused with the politics of French imperialism. Um, this set of conditions um, prompted Leila Sabar to um, produce an original book in French which reflected on these childhoods their writers and their, the literary portraits that they gesture to, um, and also the environments out of which these authors emerge. So the childhoods that are represented in this volume um, are Jewish, but they are, as the authors argue, also Moroccan, Algerian, Tunisian, Egyptian, Lebanese, and Turkish, with each individual contribution or each essay testifying to um, the dramatic community in which each author was born, multicultural, multilingual, um, multi-sectarian. Um, this is the first time these essays have been made available um, to an English-speaking public. The original version published in um, French in 2012 was awarded the Prix Chaim Zafrani, a prize given by the Elie Institute of Jewish Studies to a literary project that valorizes Jewish civilization in the Muslim world. And we hope more prizes will follow uh, with the English language <laughs> translation. Now to turn to our speakers. Leah Rosedahl is professor of French and Francophone Studies in the Department of European Languages and Transcultural Studies here at UCLA, where she is also a Libby Center affiliate. Her most recent book is Absent the Archive, Cultural Traces of a Massacre in Paris of 17 October 1961. Um, Rebecca Glassberg is currently the Ellie Weinhardt Postdoctoral Fellow at the Taub Center for Jewish Studies at Stanford University. Her research, uh, which took shape during her doctoral years here at UCLA, focuses on representations of Jews and Jewishness in French language, North African literary production from the mid-20th century to the present day. And our guest, Jill Jarvis, who will be facilitating um, Q&A with the authors on stage before we open it up to a broad conversation with everyone in this room. Professor Jarvis is assistant professor in the Department of French and a member of the Councils on African Studies and Middle East Studies at Yale University. 
Her first book, Decolonizing Memory, Algeria and the Politics of Testimony, was published in 2021 um, and won the MLA Scalioni Prize for French and Francophone Studies. And her next book, Signs in the Desert, Aesthetic Cartographies of the Sahara, to be published by the University of Chicago Press, builds a case for how contemporary writers and filmmakers from across the African Sahara confront the colonial ideology of desert emptiness. Am I right that this forthcoming? Yes. Um, with uh, Rahim El uh, Ghibli and Francisco Robas, she is a founding member of the Desert Futures Collective. So it's my delight to welcome these wonderful scholars together. Uh, thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you so much for that introduction. And I wanted to just express gratitude for this event taking place and to the Levy Center for bringing me all the way from New Haven yesterday um, to warm and sunny California. It is really nice to be here. Um, and also to Leah for the invitation to participate with both of you, Rebecca and Leah, in this conversation. And this really will be a conversation between us about the book that really opens up the book so that we can bring those voices into the room. Um, and I was reading it again on the airplane yesterday and really struck by the, the photographs on the cover and on the pages. And I wanted to start there. On the cover, as you can see here, there are three black and white photographs. Um, on the left, we have one of Shoshana Bukhubsa and her little sister on a street in Munanville, Fax. Tunisia in 1963. And you can see the foreground. You can't see the whole photograph here, but you will later. The foreground is a little bit blurry. So we see the white building, the car, there's a man walking on the pavement behind them, which are in clearer focus than the faces that we see. Um, we have Rita Rachel Cohen on the right and her big, quite, quite much taller than her, um, her big brother Joe in their swimsuits on a beach in the seaside neighborhood of Shatbi, Alexandria, Egypt in 1956. And then in the center, we have this portrait of Annie Tayeb Goldman at five or six years old with a serious face, a studio portrait taken in Matur in the north of Tunisia, sometime I think in the 1930s, although she doesn't give a date. And that photograph really strikes me. It's torn and folded. It looks fragile. There's a tear across the center of the photograph that you can glimpse here that's been carefully pieced back together. And there's transparent tape holding it together that you can see faintly in the photo. And I'm struck by the effort and the care to reconstitute this faded, wrinkled image and the effort and the care that has been taken to generate curate, arrange, and then translate and rearrange these stories in this book. Um, each of the 34 essays, there we go, it works. Each of the 34 essays in the collection of Jewish childhood memories from the Muslim Mediterranean includes a photograph of the author as a child, which I understood they, understand they gave to Leila Sidbar as part of this project, right? Photographs in Turkey, in Lebanon, in Egypt, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. Some of the authors, there we go, did not have photographs of themselves as children. Daniel Siboni here includes a photograph of doors along Der Jama Street in the Bahia part of the Marrakesh Medina. And here, Ami Bouganiam, born in Essaouira, which was then called Mogador, includes a calligraphy painting in which one of the strokes of the Arabic word El Khouba is also the F of its translation into French, fraternité. So I'm so struck by these images that are a part of the text um, and th that are part of these sort of disparate and intricate stories that in Leila Sebar's words and yours, the, uh, from the introduction, carve out a literary space for an encounter that, quote, brings together those so often separated by colonial history. And I'm struck by what this book is and does, and I look forward to opening this up with you in conversation, right, this kind of archive, a gathering or summoning of images, uh, both written and visual, that generate or reconstitute complex memory where history has been made to appear almost absence. Right? An effort to attest to a complex presence of Jews who have lived in these places for so long, for centuries, millennia even, places where as of the last 60 or so years, so few Jews continue to live for complex reasons that we can delve into. Right? And Sebar writes in her introduction, we think we've forgotten them, 
But they are there, in these voices, in the pages of writers, in exile, and in the childhood of the last generation of this history. All right, so I wanted to open up conversation actually by reading some excerpts from one of the essays, um, the one by Shoshana Bukhubsa, who is the taller person there, I believe. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> and there she is with her sister in Sfax in Tunisia in 19, early 1960s. Because I feel, and I think you agree with me, that it's important to frame this whole conversation by staying with the particulars of each of the myriad voices that constitute the collective volume and to let their voices in. Right? And Bukhubsa is responding to this invitation from Sebar to write about her own childhood in Sfax and to, to come back to those memories and to put them into writing. Uh, her family departed for Paris after Bourguiba became president, if I recall the story mm -hmm. accurately, when she was four years old. So she writes decades later in French, and here translated by one of the four translators of the text. This one's by Jane Kuntz. So I'll read from these translated words um, of Bukhubsa, and I think open to questions that we can discuss. Mm -hmm. She writes, I can't tell whether I'm writing to remember or whether I'm writing to create memories for myself. Though only a child, I understood that we'd been uprooted, understood that on one side there was the tree, the family tree, that sought to regain its verticality, its balance, and that on the other there was a hold, a place, or sorry, a hole, <laughs> the place where our roots had once thrived, a gaping hole, over there, far away. Why? Because they didn't want Jews in Muslim lands anymore, because there was Israel, because we had become westernized, because the arrow of history was pointing in a different direction. I'm 50 years old today. I'm constantly creating questions and answers for myself. I'm constantly constructing images for myself. This way, sometimes I feel like I'm seeing my grandfather's synagogue. I feel like I'm seeing myself playing on the streets. I feel like I know this facts, seaside, where, according to my grandmother, sailors from the four corners of the world would make stopovers. I'm steeped in old, yellowed photographs, mostly in black and white. In our building in Paris, they called us the Tunisians. One day it occurred to me suddenly that we were foreigners. I realized then that we had been ejected from a country like someone ejected from a plane without a parachute. What my eyes saw, I am unable to recover. What my skin felt, I can't bring back to life. But Sfax draws a little closer every time I speak in Arabic. Every time I say, Flamen, Tmenek, Mlarha. Every time I leave one of my children with a Rabbi Mak. Every time they sneeze and I murmur, Atahish. Or when they hurt themselves and I say, Snalla. I'm from there, from Sfax. It's written on my ID, born in. So with Bukhubsa's words sort of ringing uh, the first notes of our conversation, I thought we could move to the big picture mm -hmm. um, to get a better sense, we heard about it a bit, but what this project is, its origins, its history, to help orient our audience and maybe entice them to either buy the book or look up the open access version after this. Um, and we might begin with the title itself. Here we go. A Jewish Childhood in the Muslim Mediterranean. That's the English version of the title given to the collection by Sebar in the 2012 French edition, Une enfance juive en Méditerranée musulmane. So I just thought we could start there. What does this particular title conjure, and does it have some limits or some risks? And I'll let you, either of you can start. Okay, okay. great. Um, thank you so much, Phil, for that really evocative introduction. Um, very poignant choice of text selection also. Um, I, I will answer your question, but if I might as a preamble just also add um, my voice to the chorus of thanks um, to the Libby Center and the other various sponsors, including my own home department of European Languages and Transcultural Studies um, for, their, for their sponsorship and support of this work. And thank you all for being here. It's really lovely to see many familiar faces, but also equally lovely to see faces of those I don't know, who I assume are here by pure interest and not just uh, friendly solidarity. Or we appreciate both, obviously. Um, I also want to thank some important people who aren't in the room, um, and they are Jane Kuntz, 
Robert Watson and Rebecca Vince, and they are um, three of the four translators who were essential in getting this work uh, moved from French into English and published. Uh, Jane, Rebecca, and the fourth translator was myself. Uh, uh, but Jane, uh, Jane Kutz really did the bulk of the work. Um, Robert and Rebecca uh, translated about a handful of essays each. Um, and I feel compelled to point out that all of these people worked for free and for the love of this project. Um, and I'm deeply grateful to their work, um, to their work and their care and their attention um, in, in bringing these voices to us in English. Um, we'll talk more about how um, I came to work on this project and how Rebecca came to work on the project with me. Um, but I will say that um, uh, the, the, the task of the translator obviously is a really important one in this, uh, in this, in this project. Um, and I feared it wouldn't have really seen the light of day if I hadn't been able to count on, on, on their work and, and again, the care they took in, uh, in, in translating these voices. Um, that being said, I want to turn to your question and about the title um, and also add that your selection of Bukopsa as a kind of emblem figure for the beginning of this conversation is, is, is really apt because her essay encapsulates so much of um, what's important about this volume. Um, themes of childhood, obviously, um, the, the sort of problematization and questioning of memory and memories, so what the adults truly recalls about his or her own childhood, what, what they might invent, etc. cetera. Um, this idea of displacement, um, this idea of being foreign at home and foreign in exile, of not belonging, of being other, all of these things um, are, we find to different degrees and in different um, manifestations throughout the essays of the volume. Um, and then there's also the ultimate paragraph, which is really interesting for the way in which um, Shoshana Bukopsa drops words in Arabic into her French and now into her English. Um, and the way in which she does so without commentary, right? It, it's sort of, this is how she speaks, right? Blending languages always um, and somewhat, um, somewhat subconsciously or unconsciously. Um, so we find that also in different ways throughout all of the essays, which to, to different degrees deal with this kind of polyglossic or multilingual environment in which uh, the authors grew up. So what does this title conjure? It's an, it's an interesting title. If you know Lena Sebar at all, Lena Sebar again is the editor of the, the original French. Um, she has had in the past, say, 20 years of her life a kind of fascination with childhood as a theme, as an organizing principle, as a kind of method, um, a literary method, also kind of an existential method. So she has a number of volumes, all of which um, go by the title a, a Childhood In, right? So a childhood overseas, a childhood in pre-war Algeria, a childhood in Algeria during the war, et cetera, et cetera. This, I believe, is the ultimate or the most recent of her childhood volumes. Um, and here she takes up the question of a, a Jewish childhood in the Muslim Mediterranean. Um, and so your question about what it, um, what it conjures or what it conjures, <laughs> um, I think is already very evocative. Right? Even the idea of a Muslim Mediterranean is a concept that could be seen as problematic, right? If we think of the Mediterranean from the north side, we don't think of necessarily the Mediterranean element. She's obviously drawing our attention to this kind of southern coast, long coastline of the Mediterranean. Um, Turkey also is kind of an outlier in this volume. It's, it's Mediterranean, but not always thought of as, as part of the Mediterranean basin. And so there's a kind of um, geographical imaginary that's being conjured through this, this particular title. Um, there's also sort of the nuts and bolts of who belongs to this particular Muslim Mediterranean. Um, the authors, the 34 authors who are featured in this volume all hail from six countries, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, Lebanon, and Turkey. It's a kind of idiosyncratic selection for, the, for a Muslim Mediterranean, if you will. Um, I think the inclusion of Turkey is a little bit of a, Turkey remains a kind of outlier in this, um, sort of geopolitically and culturally. Um, there's also an absence. Um, we don't find Libya, we don't find Syria. Um, who else is missing? We don't find, well, <laughs> we don't find Israel. We don't find Iraq, which one might argue that it's not a Mediterranean country, but it is a country that sort of belongs to this MENA, or Middle East, North African region, where there was um, a, a Jewish population. So it's, um, it's an interesting title, uh, insofar as it, in, it seems to include a lot, and it's also kind of partial in its, um, in its geographical expression. Rebecca, if you want to add anything? 
feel free. No, I think that was... I'll, I'll bring you in soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, is there anything else about Sebar's motivations that you want to point us to to understand about this project? Um, oh, Go ahead. Um, no, no, no. Um, I wanted to point out that Leila Sebar, I don't remember if we said this already, herself is not Jewish, um, and she has a very interesting family history. So she was uh, born and raised in colonial Algeria, and her father was a Muslim Algerian colonial subject, um, and her mother was a French citizen who was teaching um, in colonial Algeria. So while she does not share kind of this in-betweenness because she is not Jewish, she does also sit kind of in an interesting place in terms of colonizer colonized bina mm -hmm. binaries, France versus North Africa. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I think that I would surmise that perhaps that's something to do with an interest mm -hmm. in, in this particular question with a certain group of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it is interesting to notice that she herself isn't Jewish, and she's collecting these stories of the the Jews who've left the places that she remembers growing up in. Um, Leah, you point out in the introduction that Sebar sort of scrupulously avoids using the word Arab, an Arab Jew in particular. Mm -hmm. Why does this matter? I mean, and it's you know, Muslim Mediterranean. Right. Okay. I'm sure we could open up a whole you know, essay's worth on this, but just a few words on that. <laughs> 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 So we're, we're going to go deep into the dark heart of the matter right away. Um, so it's true, she could have, we could have imagined different configurations for the title in terms of how she labels or qualifies the, the group in question. Um, she, so it's, it's an interesting mixed bag in terms of her own um, preface to the volume and then in terms of the ways in which the various authors in the volume use or don't use words like Arab, Muslim, etc. Um, she, she could have um, obviously talked about sort of the Arab world or the Arab and Mediterranean. She chooses not to do that. Um, she could have um, talked about Arab Jews. Um, she also chooses not to do that. Um, I, I personally read it as a kind of depoliticizing gesture on her part. Um, but I think, I think embedded in this depoliticizing gesture is actually a pretty serious political agenda. Um, and I think the title is provocative. Uh, in all that it looks plain, I think the, t the title is provocative, in fact, for what it omits as much as for what it says. Um, there's a lot, there's a long and sort of complicated story behind the polemics of like Arab Jews and um, the whole sort of story of Jews and Arabs and um, the use of ethnic markers versus religious markers, which I won't, <laughs> not to where I can see each other, <laughs> which I won't, I won't expand on, on too much right now, but I think that those polemics are exactly what she's gesturing to in a kind of sidelong glance as opposed to sort of pointing at it directly. Um, and speaking of Sebar's agenda, would you tell us about how you got involved in this project? Is that, that's okay? <laughs> yeah, it's a great story. <laughs> and, and maybe you can also weigh in on how you became involved too. Um, okay, so from the political to, uh, to the coffee shop. Um, <laughs> coffee shops are very political. Um, so I came to this project in a very, um, in a very sort of, I was going to say a roundabout way, but that's not true. It was very direct, um, but a surprising way. Um, in the summer of 2012, the French version had just come out, and I was in Paris um, teaching a summer program that our department has, a yearly summer program we have. And I ran into um, a friend and colleague of mine, who's actually a former graduate of our PhD program here at UCLA in French, who now works at uh, Notre Dame University. Um, and she and I had worked on similar things, and so we've been in contact over the years, and I happened to run into her on the street in Paris, as sometimes happens, even in that big city. And she said, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have coffee with Lena Sebar tomorrow, would you like to come along? I think she'd like to meet you, and I think you'd like to meet her, et cetera, et cetera. And so I said, why not? And so I go along, I remember exactly which cafe it was, and uh, I go along to meet and have coffee with Lena Sebar. And Leila hands me a copy of the French version, Une enfant juivante en Méditerranée musulmane. And within five minutes of meeting me, she hands me this book, and I think, how lovely that she thought to bring me a gift. And she pushes it across the table to me, and she says to me, you'll translate it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I said yes, because nobody says no to Leila Sebar. I'm sure no, very few people in this room 
I've had the chance to meet her, read her work, but she's a kind of irascible woman who does not suffer fools. And when she asks for something, you give it to her. And so I did. Um, she was a little flummoxed at the, at the publication process, which took a long time. Um, in France, the publication process is much quicker. Um, from the time I started, which was five minutes after I walked out of the coffee shop, uh, to the publication was um, 11 years. Um, so it's been a very long labor. Um, which I shouldered first by myself, then with the translators I mentioned, and then thank goodness for Rebecca, um, with, with Rebecca's incredible um, partnership. Um, so that's the story of how we came to, to work on this project. It was a great story. And can, would you like to say a word on how you became involved, sure. Rebecca? So I uh, did a project my first year um, over the summer working on a trilogy of novels that Sebar had written. Um, and was kind of very surprised with a certain dynamic in one of those novels featuring a Jewish character. Um, and they were making a film and there was discussions of like the Arab passing as a Jew or the Jew playing an Arab in the film. And I was talking about this with Leah and it kind of planted the seed. I remember you telling me like this could be an interesting avenue to look down questions of Jewishness in North African literature. And so I had started thinking about it and, and kind of taking some steps and then Leah, as she so nicely did, finally wrote me an email one day. Once it became clear that I, I was interested in, in pursuing this line of inquiry, that she had an opportunity that I could definitely say no to and it would be okay and I would not suffer anything and she would still work with me. Um, but that she you know, want, wanted to you know, know if I would be interested in helping her work on the book. Mm -hmm. um, and when you love the author, and you really like the professor, and you really love books, you know, there's no question. Um, so I started, and then I think, and then at one point I got promoted to co-editor, which was a very exciting moment. Um, but yeah, it started off like that, and then it's just been, it's been very exciting to see how it's evolved in the different kind of parts of the process. Um, so yeah, yeah. And I'll ask you a little bit later about the process because I'm, I'm sure people in the audience would like to know a bit more about that. Um, but maybe we could get into the book first a bit more and then we can zoom back out. But And Leah, you put it so well in your introduction um, that there is, this is your, word, your words here, no single coherent picture mm -hmm. that emerges from this collection to explain Jewish experience and identities across these places. Um, so I think that's an apt description, and I think we can delve into that a bit more. And I'm also intrigued, though, by in the title, The Singular, A Jewish Childhood, mm -hmm. in the title, given the real multiplicity mm -hmm. and ambivalences um, in the stories themselves and the experiences reflected across the story. So I guess a question to both of you is also, is there a tension, then, between this shared sense of Jewish experience and the real differences and specificities in each of the different accounts? And um, I mean, Rebecca, maybe we could bring you in as, as editor because one of the things, one of your contributions was to write sort of um, regional, uh, how, what would you call those, orientations, mm -hmm. right, yeah. to each of the regions. Um, and so maybe you could say something about how and why you crafted those editorial reframings of the history of each region mm -hmm. and some of the, I don't know, some of the um, shared themes and threads that you saw coming out of those places. And then, yeah, maybe we can mm -hmm. move on with. The, the sort of differences. Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. So that was, I think, one of kind of the first bigger topics that I started working on is we wanted to, in the reorganization, have kind of like a brief historical synopsis um, with an eye for kind of situating the the stories in their in their context. And so we talked a little bit about kind of what are the themes, what are the common issues that crop up among stories of the same, from the same country. So for example, in Turkey, there's the Varlik tax, which was a tax levied on minorities um, that came up a lot. So kind of what are these touch points from the time period of the author's experience um, that are talked about that we wanted to make sure to include, but then also kind of a nod to the longer Jewish existence in these different countries. Um, so I'm, uh, a literary scholar, not used to doing the historical writing, but there was a lot of <laughs> researching <laughs> um, into that and f figuring out kind of how to do in, in, in a relatively short amount of time kind of a condensed overview of Jewish experience in this particular country, 
with a focus on kind of the more modern period that these authors would have lived. Um, but then in terms of, you know, there are certain themes. So for example, Algeria is one, when I was thinking about, you know, the Vichy period comes up um, in quite a few. Um, so there are certain kind of commonalities. And the Camille Decree. And the Camille Decree, but the way that they're handled are all very different. So one might expect, you know, so in, um, when the Jews lost their citizenship because of uh, the, in 1940, I, you know, going into, if you go in with assumptions that that will be the story for all of them, then you are wrong because you have someone whose family is Jewish and they don't lose their French citizenship because their family had military honors. Mm -hmm. There's another person who didn't lose their French citizenship because their family had become French before the Kenya decree. And then you have people whose family lose their citizenship. So mm -hmm. even when the there's... Ones who came from Libya. Yeah. So <laughs> even when there's kind of unifying ties, the experience with it is very different. Um, so the book kind of pushes against any expectation you might have that these moments are going to necessarily resemble one another, even though there are a lot of times when you'll find these common experiences um, that were clearly very significant within the childhoods that are being described. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what other, I mean, if you can just elaborate insights that are generated across these very different accounts about Jewish experience or relationships between Jews and Muslims in these places. So, I mean, there was a major shift between the, the organization of the French volume and the organization of the volume we produced, and that's one of the things Rebecca is referring to here, which is that the original French was organized alphabetically by author's last name. Um, we, we can show you the table of contents for that in a minute. Um, there were political reasons for that, I eventually learned, um, that there was a lot of infighting um, amongst the authors as to who should be first. <laughs> and of course. So in, in, a in her irascible way, said, I'm putting you in alphabetical order and I want to hear from you about that. <laughs> um, and so, that's, it's, um, so it creates an interesting flow, and I use the word interesting um, for lack of a better word. It, it creates a flow that, that, that's, that doesn't perhaps prompt you to look for commonalities amongst, um, well, regional co commonalities, let's put it that way, which has its benefit. Um, but I will say my experience of reading the French in that order, um, now that we have done the translation, now that I have read our translation, organized um, by, by region, in fact, by country, I feel that, um, that it produces, actually, I'm going to go ahead and say a more compelling volume. Um, the reason being because even though now we've organized them according to region and provided these, we call them I think country snapshots yeah. ultimately, mm -hmm. that offer historical context and um, some background to make the book more pedagogically sort of available and accessible. Um, so notwithstanding this organization into a kind of um, format that might suggest well Algerian experience was like this whereas Turkish experience was like that, notwithstanding that you still get an incredible amount of variety and heterogeneity, heterogeneity within each region. And so I think, interestingly, despite this kind of um, application of a, of a kind of regional method, what, what emerges more, in fact, is the diversity of experience across the region, mm -hmm. within each, across the Mediterranean region, within each individual region, but also prompts you to look for the kind of tensions within each individual piece. Mm -hmm. um, just to, to sort of mention rapidly, you know, we have one piece where um, an author is talking about relations between Jews and Muslims, and he sets up a pretty dark picture, um, talking about instances where he's experienced anti-Semitism, where he's been called dog of a Jew, et cetera, et cetera. And then in the next line, he says something about how we maintain generally good relationships with our Muslim neighbors. So you see that this sort of, these sort of tensions about how to describe the nugget of this book, which is essentially living together, right, Jews and Muslims living together, you see that this tension occurs even within an individual. And I think that, that, is, um, that that's one of the sort of essential threads we've sought to mm -hmm. make available mm -hmm. to readers without hopefully pointing to it too directly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, were there other examples that you wanted to bring in that, I don't know, that sort of demonstrate this incredible variation and ambivalence among the stories? Um. You know, we've, we were just uh, over lunch talking about all of the different stories and it's hard to even choose one. Let me, I'm going to make a stab here. Um, let's see, 219. So this is a piece by um, 
from the Moroccan section of the book, which is the last section of the book, um, by a writer named Lucette Eder Goldenberg, mm -hmm. and uh, she is from Marrakesh originally. Um, interestingly, there's a lot of emphasis on place throughout the novel, throughout the novel, throughout the volume. Um, but we do, again, these are some of the, some of the things that emerge sort of thematically and reading across. We tend to notice in the Maghreb, so in Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia, much more emphasis on descriptions of cities and much more sort of very detailed descriptions of, um, of toponyms, of, of place. Um, whereas we find that, I think, significantly less in Egypt for reasons that I think have to do with the ways in which French colonialism weighed in on urban planning in, uh, more, more strongly in, in, in the Maghreb. Um, so, Lucette uh, Talal Goldenberg, uh, born in Marrakesh, every essay is also sort of grounded with a place name, whether it's a city or a street or a courtyard. Um, and she, she talks about sort of experiences of separation of the religions. Um, and then she also talks about her own relationship to Judaism in a way that I find um, charming and interesting. Um, so, she talks about the Marrakesh swimming pool. And she writes, the Marrakesh swimming pool was reserved for Muslims on Fridays, for Jews on Saturday, and for Europeans on Sunday, when the pool would then be drained and refilled for them prior to opening. <laughs> I didn't go to the Marrakesh pool. What day would have been mine? Again, being both Francophone, being, being Jewish, it wasn't clear to her whether she fell into the Jewish or European category. Um, and throughout my first 18 years spent in Morocco, I never once crossed the threshold of a Muslim or European home even though I had Christian and Muslim classmates. And so then she goes on to say, I was Jewish, but we weren't the practicing sort. And what's more, my father was Ashkenazi, while the Moroccan Jews were highly religious and Sephardic. As a teacher in the Alliance Israelite Universelle, my father was greatly esteemed by local Jewry, but with his blue eyes and Parisian good looks, he was not considered one of their own. And consequently, nor was I, whom they took to be a French girl, and, who, and therefore never crossed a Jewish threshold either. On the other hand, in the eyes of the French, I was a Jew, since I didn't attend catechism or mass and had a name that was hardly Catholic. So I like these two paragraphs again for her sort of take on you know, not being a practicing sort, but also for the ways in which um, the swimming pool trope recalls mm -hmm. stories of, um, of racism in America and the, the separation of, uh, of, of people along the quote unquote color line, the business of sort of fears of contamination causing, you know, promoting um, uh, politics of cleaning and hygiene and cleaning the pool and things like that. And I find it fascinating that she calls that out in uh, colonial Morocco. Mm -hmm. Just to give one example of these, of these tensions. Yeah, are there other tensions or just the ways that some of the writers navigate anti-Semitism um, directly or indirectly then? Do you want to talk about that? I know you've had some. Ah, Ahmed the scenario. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So one of um, one of my favorite bits from from this piece, um, you know, when we were talking about questions of anti-Semitism, and then sometimes, you know, the the way that the children understand or don't understand religious difference or ethnic difference. Um, so this is a piece. Um, I think will perhaps maybe lead us into that discussion, but just um, that I, I find one of the pieces that really puts us in the mindset of the child that this author was. So this is Yves Turquie writing about his childhood in Beirut. Um, and uh, he's also one I just noticed that doesn't have a photo of himself as a child. Mm -hmm. but That's the street in Beirut. Yeah. Provides the street in Beirut. Um, and also, so, Another thing, one of the things that I learned when I was researching the country snapshots mm -hmm. um, is that le in Lebanon, they had such a massive influx of Jews after the founding of Israel. That was mm -hmm. the total opposite of all the other countries that we studied. Mm -hmm. um, so just right. wherever you try to generalize or you think you know this history or this experience, there's always going to be something that's going to push back against that. Uh, so this is uh, Yves Turquie. His name is Ahmed. He's my best friend. He is seven years old, just like me. I know that his parents are Muslims. He knows that mine are Jews. On Rue Kala in Beirut, everyone knows that. But you think that's a problem for kids who want to play marbles? In 1947, I was five. I thought that all children were Jewish. It was very simple. They had a mother and a father like me. They went to school like me. They ate like me. They slept in their bed like me. 
I thought they must certainly go to the synagogue like me. I was bored at the synagogue. I fell asleep while the prayers, chanted by the adults, floated up into the air. To keep me entertained, my father rented uh, rimonim for, for me, those small cylinders with bells and silver sleeves that ornament the tablets of the law. I was proud to show off my bells to my friends who had none. Alas, after 10 minutes, the sexton took them back from me. What to do? Lots of children played in the courtyard of the synagogue. They were violent, pulling each other's hair or slapping each other. Sometimes they jump on top of me shouting, Chabisa, squash. They throw me on the ground, pummel me with their fists, and pile up my back with the stern intention of beating me to pulp. At the Alliance Jewish School, Chabisa was the favorite recess game. I was quiet and timid. Off to one side on a bench, I would eat my bread, alone, while they had fun. Yet, I wanted to be their friend. Sometimes, I would approach them, get hit, and cry. And that, that was the worst, because they made fun of me. Ahmed, the baker's son on my street, never hits me, never pulls, me or my hair, pulls out my hair. When my mother says, don't stay glued to my legs, I'm cooking, I race down the stairs, and when Ahmed sees me, he jumps in the air, cries, whoa, and five minutes later, we're galloping on our horses in the little street in the neighborhood. One day, I get an idea. Mama, can we take Ahmed to the synagogue? <clears throat> My mom, she's very pretty. She's tall, and she loves me. But I must have said something senseless. She makes a strange face. So can we? No, we can't. But why can't we? Because Ahmed is Muslim. So what? So what? Muslims don't go to the synagogue. Where do they go? They go to the mosque. What's a mosque? It's a kind of synagogue for Muslims. <laughs> My project had failed, but I never lacked resources. So then, can I go with Ahmed to his synagogue? No, you can't. And why? Because you are Jewish. I said, oh. Okay. <laughs> what an amazing reading also. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the way that you bring to life the voice of the child yeah. writing this just really strikes me. I mean, that the, the way that the perspectives of children sort of unsettle and defamiliarize the things that we come to the story mm -hmm. even expecting to see is mm -hmm. really fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, you know, Rebecca's reading really captures the fact that this, this is one of the pieces where we, we really hear the child. Um, the child's reasoning, the child's mm -hmm. later on in this piece, the child's pronunciation of Arabic words, mm -hmm. uh, Palestine, it was because of Palestine, right? Mm -hmm. um, Palestine. Um, and this also highlights a kind of stylistic difference across the volume, right? So Leila Sibar asked this collection of, of writers to reflect on their Jewish childhoods, uh, and they could take whatever sort of generic turn they wanted with that project. Mm -hmm. And so some, some some of the writers actually respond to her in a letter format, mm -hmm. even saying, Dear Leila. Some are a little more subtle about it, but it's clear that they're addressing Leila Sebar as they're writing. Some of them have a more essayistic tone in the way they have approached the question. Um, one or two are actually fictional short stories where we don't, mm -hmm. the narrator is not the author. Um, and in this one, the narrator and the author are clearly the same, but he's really refound this kind of childhood voice to remember what it was like to not be able to take Ahmed to the synagogue. Um, so this is also a form of variety that we find throughout the, the, the approaches to thinking through these questions. Mm -hmm. it, Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna, going to say that one mm -hmm. of the things that I think that why I really like this piece, besides the fact that it's funny, is that it, they clearly, he gets to a point where he understands that being Jewish means something, but he doesn't necessarily understand what it means. Mm -hmm. um, and there's another piece, um, Daniel Mezguich from mm -hmm. Algeria, mm -hmm who writes, kind of getting a little bit back to your anti-Semitism mm -hmm. question, mm -hmm. um, where I believe it's a little French kid who kind of beats up on him a little bit in the courtyard and is like, is it true you're a Jew? Mm -hmm. And he, his family had always used the word Israelite, mm -hmm. which is effectively a synonym for Jewish, but he'd only ever heard Israelite, so he says, no, I'm not Jewish, I'm Israelite. And the little kid was like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and then they like go about their merry way. Um, so kind of just like the weight of these signifiers and then also how the children navigate or don't navigate them uh, is, is 
I mean, I think it, yeah. It's also a surprising, perhaps, thread um, that doesn't run throughout all of the pieces, but we find in some of them is a humoristic approach to dealing with uh, pain, suffering, mm -hmm. anti-Semitism, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, the other Lebanese, there's only two stories from Lebanon in this book, um, but the other one is also um, very funny and also recaptures a kind of childhood voice as little boy describes um, this trio of, um, of Muslim, Lebanese Muslim um, property owners who owned the summer home that his family would go to um, every, every year to escape the heat of the city. And he, he describes them as pachyderms and has these amazing ways of, of, of describing them, how they're fat and they eat too much. And, even when um, he recaptures the sort of anti-Semitic slurs that were hurled at him and his siblings by this, mm -hmm. this trio, it's all done with a kind of light touch and a kind of humoristic approach to sort of diffusing the, the sting of the, of the slur. Yeah, mm -hmm. he refers to them also. I'd, the three sea elephants right. comes in at um, one point. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then after describing kind of something that they heard, the, the three ponderal heavyweights mm -hmm. repeated this kind of not very nice slur, and he writes, it was funnier in Arabic because it rhymed. <laughs> um, like, what do, what do you do with that? And how do you situate that in context? Yeah, the, the, I think all of these stories in some way raise that question, like, what do you do with this, or how do you situate, or what do, what do you need to resituate in your own imagination mm -hmm. of these places? Um, and as you, you know, as I listen to you read, and I think you know, so maybe we can move to thinking about the, the reordering by place, mm -hmm. I think is an interesting move, but um, I'm struck by the attention that to place that emerges across the volume in such intricate specificity. Mm -hmm. um, each of the essays names place as part of the title so that the volume, especially in your um, format, creates this kind of cartography, but it's so highly particular and located, right, in all of these properly named, you know, intricate passageways in particular right. cities or particular beachfronts. Um, can you tell us, just say something about the significance of place as it plays out across these pieces, and then I'll move to the bigger structural mm -hmm. question about place. Well, I would, sort of returning to my comment earlier, we do notice a kind of difference in attention to place that it seems to be somewhat regional, and again, I would, I would probably attribute this to, um, to, to the sort of heavy-handedness of the ways in which French colonialism played out in Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia, as opposed to places where we can't really talk about colonialism per se, but more kind of protect, but there was a protectorate status in Tunisia, for example, and then um, French intervention in, in Lebanon, in Egypt, and also especially in Turkey, was very, very different from the kind of colonial sort of imperial intervention we see um, in the Maghreb. And that had a big impact on cities and seems to have also had a big impact on the ways in which the authors practice the city space um, in a way that is inflected by their identities. And to sort of take the, the sort of reverse of that, the ways in which their identities construct the city spaces. And they seem very, um, very aware of that, um, undoubtedly as a kind of, as adults sort of reflecting back on the ways in which they they move throughout the cities um, as children. Um, let me give you an example um, from let me give you an example to from um, from Marcel Benabou. Marcel Benabou is Moroccan, and he's probably one of the better known um, literary figures in this volume. Um, he was a part of a French group called the Ulipo, I should say actually, it's an international group called the Ulipo, a group of experimental writers. Um, and he has also written novels about the sort of experience growing up Jewish in Morocco. Um, and for example, he talks about um, having a fairly um, limited contact with, uh, with Muslims and Christians when he was growing up. Um, and then he finds himself at the moment in his life when he is about to enter high school. And he calls this kind of a decisive break. Um, and it's interesting in the ways in which this break is also spatialized. So he writes, and I quote, for the first time as an 11-year-old student at Pomeroy High School, an institution in the quote-unquote new city, I found myself outside the almost exclusively Jewish cocoon in which I'd grown up. To get to school, I had to walk through the Medina, an area I hardly knew. At high school, I discovered new teachers and new classmates, Christians who made up the majority, and Muslims, although only a few, with whom relations were sometimes strange, strange. But what I want to point out there is, you know, the way he configures his Jewish community as a cocoon, 
and the fact that he walks to school through the Medina, and therefore it must be very close to where he grew up, and yet it's an area he doesn't know at all. Mm -hmm. And so the way in which he goes this sort of passage into a new, a new life as an adult, um, a life where he has more contact with people who come from different religious backgrounds, is also quoted as a kind of new spatial exploration through passing through this, um, this city, um, or this part of the city. There's also, um, let me think, there's a lot of emphasis on, not a lot, but there's certain emphasis on in sort of intimate spaces, courtyards, the Hamam. Uh, Benjamin Storat is also probably one of the best known figures in this book, very famous um, uh, historian in France today. Um, his title is called, the title of his piece is The Hamam and Afterward. And he situates the Hamam in this kind of very sort of um, playing on all the chords of the Orientalist tropes, um, the hammam is kind of an originary space from which he's eventually kicked out as a kind of... Mm -hmm. The um, mother womb. The, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, there's also, I believe it's Bouganim, also a, a Moroccan writer, um, who talks about school and the spatialization of, uh, of his life and his identity. Um, and he talks about the moment um, uh, he's moved uh, from the Medina to a kind of su suburban um, setting mm -hmm. with his family, and that changed his, uh, his sort of spatial orientation with respect to uh, where he went to school. And he writes, from then on, we were situated halfway between the Hebrew school and the colonial school. My father renounced the rabb rabbinic ambitions he had entertained for me. My mother pushed me towards a secular classroom. It was a real school, complete with a courtyard planted with oak trees and poplars, a covered playground, and a weather vane knocked about by the wind. And so here, I, I love this idea that he's actually sort of physically situated between the Hebrew school and the colonial school and in the ways in which that sort of tells him in the two different directions. Mm -hmm. I love that with the weather vane. Um, yep. Which brings me to my sort of the geographical organizing principle um, of your translated volume. Mm. So, and maybe we can talk a bit about your, your process, the translational process, and the process that you two undertook together. Um, but, so, as you pointed out, the, the first volume is just the alphabetized, the first. The French volume just has the names alphabetized, the stories in this order, and then you've laid them out in this geographic arrangement that also moves from east to west, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, the map moving in the Maghreb direction, as right. it were. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us more about your reasons for this transformation and the effects of it? And then I'll have more questions about your process together. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm going to have to take this one because yeah. I think I'm responsible for, <laughs> for <laughs> this. Listen, I think I came on after this at already. Yeah. So I think once the decision was made to organize by region, there's still a question of what order you put the regions in. And um, for for a moment, I toyed with putting the regions in alphabetical order. <laughs> um, but that didn't seem very satisfying. Um, it also would have put, uh, Algeria is by far the country uh, that is the most represented in this volume. And that would have put Algeria first. And I was a little bit worried um, about sort of the optics of that. And in, in my research and my reading for the introduction, um, I read a lot about sort of the, the Mediterranean, how it's been constructed, the sort of um, tropes of the Mediterranean, um, scholarly takes on the Mediterranean, et cetera. And I was really struck by, um, by a line from Carla Mallet. And in fact, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read it to you so I get it exactly right. And um, an historian. Um, and she makes the following observation, I'm quoting her, uh, the most fundamental cultural rift in the Mediterranean is the breach between language written from left to right and language written from right to left. And that struck me as so simple and so smart at the same time. Um, I remember um, making an attempt a few years back to try to learn Arabic. Um, I did learn Hebrew when I was when I was small, but I don't remember any of it. And I, of course, at the time didn't have any kind of sense of problematizing what was going on, as nobody does when they're in Hebrew school. Um, but when I when I took up trying to learn Arabic a couple of years ago, I remember thinking about how profoundly different it felt that the writing went the other way and how we didn't talk about it. And I thought it was so brilliant that Carla Mallet sort of pulled that out as a as a tension, like a like a, kind of a physical tension, a spatial tension. Um, and I thought to myself, um, thinking sort of spatially, 
um, that left to right feels like west to east, and right to left feels mm -hmm. like east to west. Mm -hmm. And so I thought to myself, well, we have this, this, this European language, right? It's a, the, this piece, this, the original is written in French, right, which goes from left to right. Why not develop a kind of structure for the book that goes the other way and sort of meets that movement? So French going from French English, even going from left to right, Arabic Hebrew going from right to left. So I decided to start in Turkey and move east to west or left sorry, right to left, um, <laughs> across the region, um, thinking in a kind of abstract fashion that it was a way of kind of suturing this rift, right? A way of making these, these currents cross, or at least meet, or mingle, and, um, and intermingle, even. Yeah. Uh, and it seemed to me as good as an organization as any. <laughs> um, and in the end, it also had the added benefit, um, which wasn't my intention at first, of putting the regions that were less represented in terms of numbers of, of essays up front. So we have four essays from Turkey, two from Lebanon, and again, and three from Egypt. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it struck me that it sort of up fronted these sort of even more lesser known Jewish populations and their stories, particularly Turkey. Um, and it allowed us then to sort of flow into the Maghreb in, in a kind of natural, geographic way. Mm -hmm. yeah. As you were just talking about the tension between, and, and the, the sort of structural tension that works with, or against, or in, um, I guess, in a kind of energy with the left to right and the right to left, I was thinking back to this mm -hmm. image, which also encapsulates that, right? right. That the El Hua, mm -hmm. written this way, and the sort right. of this line where they meet, right. fraternité, mm -hmm. written this way. Do of, they meet or do they diverge? Yeah, do they meet or diverge? <laughs> and, it's, it's, and it's in sort of constant motion, I guess. Yeah, so exactly. That right. um, I can really feel that in the yeah. text itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, could we talk, and what time is so rapid. <laughs> um, there's so much more I want to ask, but just at least a few more questions. Mm -hmm. First, just about your collaborative mm -hmm. process, because um, it's so common, say, in the sciences for people to work together, to collaborate, to write together, to do intellectual projects together, and it's less common in the humanities. So I'd just love to hear like, what the benefits of this have been for you, what you've appreciated about collaborating, um, and what that, what that looks like for you. Maybe you could start sure. us off with that, Cass. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, this um, I think is one of, you know, I, I am very proud of my dissertation, but this I think holds kind of a special place in my doctoral program experience. Um, because it, precisely as you were saying, this is not something that is very common. Um, when, as I said before, when Leah asked me if I, if I wanted to be on the project with her and she made it very clear I would not get in trouble if I said no. Um, I jumped at the chance because I knew this. This is not a. It's not this experience doesn't come very easily. Um, we are often presented with the final product only. We never get to see how the sausage is made. We don't even know <laughs> what sausage. questions. Like we don't the kosher sausage. <laughs> we have. Um, like we we don't even know what questions to ask. You don't know what you don't know. So a to be able to see all of that, all of the moving parts. Um, particularly in this case, experience with difference in publishing with the French versus what we needed for the press here. Um, and then for me, being able to work with my advisor to know that I had an advisor that would trust me to do like important tasks. Um, and Leah laughs because I bring this up, but you know, she asked me at one point to read over and give her feedback on her introduction. I'm like, you can read over and give me feedback on my chapters, but you know, you want me to, to get all of my friends are giggling. Um, it was kind of a scary ask, because um, again, you don't know how that's going to be received. Um, and there was one particular moment, um, which Leah doesn't remember, but I was totally terrified because I felt like the, in the introduction there was, there needed to be more attention to the way that the word Arab is racialized um, and represents like a racialized category. Um, and so I'm you know, trying to figure out how do I tell my advisor this in a way that is productive. And you know, clearly she didn't, it didn't, it was all me. Um, but so there were moments like that that were both kind of edifying and that I am capable of doing this work. And then also with a person who would guide me through and help me knowing that I had none of this experience. Um, 
which I, again, was, you know, a significant boon to my, to my progress here and something that I have learned just an incredibly vast amount from. Um, I mean, it was far more terrifying for me than it was for you. <laughs> um, I, I have to say, like, I, um, as a graduate student, I witnessed a couple of uh, collaborations like this. I, I, I wasn't a part of them, but um, I, had, I had colleagues who had opportunities given what they were working on and who they were working with to participate in, um, in, in an, edit, an editorial project, a significant editorial project with their advisor. And I, I, I believe it's a really important and foundational um, mentoring tool and professionalization experience. I mean, Rebecca really, she jokes about the, how, seeing how the sausage is made, but she really did see... The kosher sausage. Um, the kosher sausage. She really did see like, behind the scenes in a way that I think you don't get to see until you're sort of trying to shepherd your own book through an editorial process. And she was copied on all the emails and, with the, with the press, um, both with UC Press, but also in our communications with the French press. Um, she's also met Leila Sebar, she was with the translators, she edited um, alongside me all of the pieces, um, and then ultimately ended up um, being responsible for writing these kinds of country snapshots to give historical ballast to each of the sections. And um, going back to my own experience in graduate school, sort of observing that sort of interaction, I mean, quite frankly, I thought to myself, I hope I have the opportunity to give this chance to a student someday. But it's not obvious, because not every project lends itself to this type of collaboration, right? And there's also the pressures within academia to produce monographs, right, for, you know, to produce your own work. So when I arrived at UCLA as an assistant professor, I mean, the, the focus was on writing a book <laughs> of my own, not on collaborating or providing other opportunities. But, um, so it really depends on the project, it depends on where you are in your career, um, it depends on who your students are um, and what they're interested in. Um, for example, I have a student who works on film, uh, and I, I would be more than happy to provide this kind of opportunity to her, but a project like this in film hasn't necessarily come my way either. Um, and so there was a kind of perfect confluence of the project itself, um, the fact that I frankly needed help um, to get it done. It was a big, managing 34 mm -hmm. translations um, is a big job um, if you want to do it well. Uh, and then the reorganization was also a big job. Um, and I, I wanted to be able to have somebody who could not just help out in terms of project management, but also um, as an intellectual resource. Um, Rebecca's gone much further down the path learning Arabic than I was able to do, so that was also really helpful in terms of providing footnotes. The, the English version has um, extensive footnotes um, to help the readers sort of find their way through a vocabulary and through an historical context. And Rebecca and I wrote those together. Um, and, you know, I think, I, I like to think it was a great experience for you. It's been a great experience for me to work with you. And I think um, represents a model for mentorship that's really yeah. important and that I would, would love to see happen more. Yeah, as would I. And I think, I just, I can attest talking to you both about the project. Um, I can just see how much it has meant to you and also how much you have brought to the project. It seems really that it couldn't be what it is without this kind of collaboration mm -hmm. in some sense. Sure. Um, so it's incredible. And I guess I just wanted to ask one last question to conclude and then open mm -hmm. two questions um, from the audience. But in, I mean, to, to <coughs> name the elephant in the room or to really enter into the political terrain that Sebar herself seemed rather keen to avoid in a pretty explicit way, but where does Palestine fit into the, the picture? Because it really is in, in so many of these, these pictures, if um, mm -hmm. you wanted to take that up just briefly. Mm -hmm. and then you want to start? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I can read my, if you want to start and then I read, or I read and then you um, read. Azulé? Yeah. I, I can let me say a few things. Okay. Um, so, it's interesting. <laughs> One of the benefits of having, um, having, um, having this book exist also as uh, an open access um, e-reader is that you have the benefit of keyword searches. And so I'm sort of curious to, to see how often the word um, Israel comes up or Palestine comes up in, uh, in the text. It's actually pretty rare. Um, again, just to remind everybody, is Israel-Palestine as a region is not represented in the volume. Um, the word itself 
uh, comes up uh, very rarely. Um, and then not all writers engage the question of the conflict. Um, some do, very directly, uh, but very few. And then there's these sort of interesting moments where it's a, it's a childhood um, sort of uh, a childhood um, sort of art, an artifact of like a child childlike state, right? So, for example, in um, in the longer passage, Rebecca read from the Turkey piece, which is called the Baker's Son, um, where he wants to take his best friend to the synagogue but can't because he's Muslim. Um, a few paragraphs later, the author talks, or the the, the child says. Something to the effect of, um, we had to move apartments several times. I don't understand why. Apparently, we're going to have to go move to France. My dad says it's because of Palestine. I don't know what that is, right? So that's not something that's keyword searchable, obviously. But there's something very tender about the way in which the, the conflict sort of enters into the, the child's mind in, in through that, that, that word choice, right? Um, some of our authors are. Um, Again, a few of them are pretty explicit about their, their views on the conflict. Um, but I think Rebecca and I really like this one passage um, from the Moroccan writer, Andréa Zuleg, also a very important figure in, in Morocco today, um, somebody who continues to live in Morocco, who lives between France and Morocco, but continues to have a very important public presence in Morocco um, as a writer, as a public intellectual, also as an advisor to the monarchy. Um, and his piece um, provides us with a kind of interesting um, assessment. And I'll let you, I'll let you take it. Uh, so uh, this is one of the pieces that I remember when I first started the project. Mm -hmm. um, that has, it was very poignant then, and forgive me if I tear up when I read it now, because it remains just as, if not more, um, mm. powerful. Um, so this is called For Other Tomorrows, and it's by André Azoulay, who grew up in Essaouira, then called Mogador. So he writes, I must have been 12 or 13, and nevertheless, more than half a century later, there is an image, a furtive instant, a few seconds of light that I faithfully keep present in my mind as if it were yesterday, with the same emotion, the same power, and the same singularity, abundantly rich in its exceptionality. An image, an instant, a light that will have kept me company all my life, giving me rootedness in a Muslim, Berber, Arab, and Jewish society, the society of my country, Morocco, a depth and a legitimacy that will triumph over all the vicissitudes of the moment. Over all the doubts as well, and the dizziness of amnesia, which for too long have undermined and made fragile the cultural, historic, and human space that Muslims and Jews created and shared for nearly a millennium in the Maghreb and the Middle East. It was an autumn evening in the 1950s in my father's office at the end of a little street in the Kasbah of Essaouira Mogador. A friend of the family, whom we called Hajj the Imam, had just come in and, after the ritual gre greetings, had taken out from the folds of his jalaba a little beige-colored bag full of earth that he delicately put in my father's hands, saying, this is for you and your family. I just returned from my pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and since it is impossible for you to go there, I came to share my prayers with you and to bring you some of this holy land that belongs to both of us. It was much later that I understood the full extent of what I had just witnessed and the character, which today seems utterly surreal, of this scene. Its depth, its modernity, and its truth took on all the more texture and complexity in light of the fact that for the child that I was and for my father and his friend, this spontaneous and fraternal sharing of the sacred was nothing exceptional. For the three of us, it fit in naturally with the everyday social, social relations between Muslims and Jews in Essaouira. This is, as everyone will understand, much more than an anecdote. And it is this sudden revelation of what is possible that I deliberately choose to single out in order to give true meaning to the evocation of my childhood and my lived experience as a Jew in Muslim land. Thank you for reading that. 
I made it through. We did make it through. <laughs> um, and I love the, the title of that piece, For Other Tomorrows with a Question Mark. Yeah. And the, the last line of that piece, I have it in my notes here. Mm -hmm. But as should be clear, my Jewish life in a Muslim land is not simply a nostalgic childhood memory. And it is not only written in the past, but this sense of a, a future that could be other than the present, I think mm -hmm. is really beautiful. And I think with that note, um, we have about 15 minutes to take questions from the audience. And I think just in the interest of um, time so that people can get their voices and make sure that you've formulated a question and direct it um, to our speakers, not to me, um, so that we can hear more from them about these works. So I, I sort of generously open the floor to questions from the audience. Go ahead. Yes, you. And we'll repeat. Stand up and, and, and project, I think. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm Miranda. I'm a first year student in the ELS department. Um, and uh, first of all, thank you all three of you for a fantastic um, discussion. Uh, Rebecca, I was crying in my seat like 30 seconds ago. You got me. Thank you. Um, so uh, let me try and be as brief as I can, even though it might, might wander. Um, listening to this discussion, I was drawn to a word that I've been hearing a lot recently, which is um, a Yiddish word, doikai, which means hereness, or wherever we are is home, um, which is something I've been mulling over quite a, quite a bit recently, as I'm, and a lot of people have. So I was just wondering if um, any of you could speak to what these authors, because I haven't had a chance to read the book yet, how they conceive of their home and their, and their physical presence there. Which I know it's a big question, but any anything kind of related to that would be cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Were you all able to hear the question? Okay. I'll let you take it, either one of you. <laughs> so the question has to do with um, home and how these authors can see the home. Um, I think it's worth noting that if there's 34 or 35, if we count say by herself, authors represented here, um, almost none of them lived in their homes or the, the countries where they were born. Um, I think there are two exceptions. Um, two of the Turkish authors, uh, one, one of the Turkish authors remained in Turkey. She never, she's probably the only author who did not experience um, exile and migration. Uh, one of the Turkish authors left to England and then returned um, and now, now, now lives in, in Turkey in Istanbul. Um, but other than those two, and perhaps we can make an exception for Azulay, who goes back and forth quite a bit, um, they all make their homes elsewhere than their original homes. Mm -hmm. And um, and many of them, I think the Shoshana Bukopsa example that uh, Jill opened with is, is very poignant about that. Many of them sort of continue to feel a sense of dislocation, even as they have become, for the most part, um, French. Would you like to speak to it or take another question? I was just thinking, I think it's Ms. Gish who says, I need a visa to visit my childhood. Right, um, yeah. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, one of the themes that comes up um, is, you know, having the sense that what is at, one is at home in a place and a time that no longer exists mm -hmm. um, for different reasons, depending on the author. Right. Um, and also sometimes depending on the region, right? Because within yeah. the Algerian Jews, there's also a greater tension with Frenchness than yeah. you find in the Tunisian and the Moroccan pieces, um, and which doesn't really exist in the Egyptian, Lebanese, and Turkish pieces because mm -hmm. becoming French um, and the, the, the sort of heavy-handedness of Frenchness wasn't as, um, as much of a factor in their everyday lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. I might just say something briefly, um, but just as a scholar who spent time in Algeria and Morocco and just noticing all of the mm -hmm. traces of absence and the mm -hmm. synagogues that have been repurposed right. or the houses that have, you know, menorah sort of right. designs that have been repurposed, mm -hmm. I think it's so striking just the, the very act, sort of archival act of, mm -hmm. of creating this work mm -hmm. sort of inscribes um, Jewish presence Mm -hmm. and memories in these places that they also constituted right. and constitute mm -hmm. right. um, in places where they seem to have been made absent. And I just mm -hmm. find that really striking in terms yeah. of yeah. I mean, what it is to be Moroccan means that this is a part of the, the very material and um, spiritual place. Right, right, um, right. 
Uh, there were two questions I saw. The one here that with the black sweater, and then Sarah, and then we'll take some more. And okay. <laughs> had this book in my library for a long time. Uh, I'm so glad this is going to be available mm -hmm. to English-speaking audiences and especially open access. Yeah. Um, second, maybe it's more of a question. I'm from a family of an Algerian Jews who grew up in Morocco and then lived in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I kind of wonder about the transnational aspect because you organize this in such a mm -hmm. organization. And I know this is highly individual. Again, mm -hmm. as the whole book is. Mm -hmm. But how would you maybe translate this transnational aspect within the book? With the, also the question of home, of course, mm -hmm. because a lot of people then live in the place. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. How would we translate the transnational question? Because all these communities, um, I mean, my family's from Bolivia, Atlanta, and mm -hmm. these communities would say, like, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. between the colonial um, right. countries. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, one, one example that comes to mind immediately is Aldo Nauri, who, um, it's funny, I was speaking with Leda Sebar about this, and I said something about the absence of Libya, of Libya as, as a country with, uh, represented within the bottom, and she said, but there's Aldo Nauri, and it's true, but he is under the Algerian um, sort of rubric, because although his family was Libyan, um, they, they migrated to, um, to Algeria, and he, he, writes, um, he writes poignantly, actually, about the experience of Italian colonialism in Libya and French colonialism in Algeria, and he prefers the French one. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of other small examples of sort of transnational families or transnational subjects that would resemble more your own experience, but not, not a lot. They're not, at least in these, I, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but in the selection, however partial we have, of the experience, um, most of the authors um, are rooted in one of the countries um, for their childhood until they end up migrating, usually to France, sometimes to Israel, sometimes to uh, Quebec. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll take, there were many questions, I think. Sarah had one, and then I'll, Raphael. Okay, um, maybe we could collect some, too. That's great. Um, my question builds on the previous ones, mm -hmm. um, and you just started to address at the end, but my impression was that most of the authors that Savar curated originally mm -hmm. land in France. Yeah. And so I, the questions I wanted to ask mm -hmm. were, um, how does that current state of Frenchness mm -hmm. actually shape mm -hmm. a vision of childhood in the Muslim Mediterranean mm -hmm. that could potentially, mm -hmm. I, I don't really know, mm -hmm. look very different if narrated from mm -hmm. Buenos Aires, mm -hmm. Montreal, mm -hmm. you know, or Fill in blank or Tel Aviv, mm -hmm. um, and so how might that um, have, mm -hmm. have have shaped memory mm -hmm. and um, and a, a, a uniquely French right. um, mm -hmm. form of nostalgia? Right. Yeah. 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 Well. I was going to say that that's a great question. Um, no, I, I wonder because there is specifically I'm thinking of the Algeria pieces or you know excellent Frenchmen mm -hmm. um, that there certain pieces that write kind of poignantly about trying to be subsumed you know kind of this tension between being Alger Algerian Jewish and French because Algerian Jewish, mm -hmm. um, and some of them you can tell kind of, you know, with Stora's piece, there's a certain amount of, you know, becoming French and kind of... Like a triumphal narrative. Yeah, a triumphal narrative, so that exists, but then in not in all of them, um, or, but I don't, I think, is it Ida Kumer who ends with Tunisian mm -hmm. I am, Tunisian mm -hmm. I remain, mm -hmm. but I don't, I think she's in the States. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm, that is a good question. I hadn't thought about kind of mapping that kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. Something to think about. It sounds either. like an archive to keep building. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, go ahead. Well, uh, I have one small factual correction, mm. maybe, and then something to deal with exclusion and inclusion. Mm. The factual correction, um, it was a very nice idea to start from the mm. countries that write from left to right, mm -hmm. but Turkey does not. So. Mm -hmm. They write the European way mm -hmm. for a century. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. kind of yeah. 
But then there's yeah, Ottoman talking Turkish. About, yeah. <laughs> talking about Turkey is the question of my own feeling of inclusion exclusion mm -hmm. because without being Jewish mm -hmm. and without living in a Muslim country, mm -hmm. I share so much mm -hmm. of that right. from the Balkans right. and from being the south of the Balkans. Right. And so sometimes I wonder, like, do we form the Jewish childhood? Mm -hmm. What would have happened if these people were asked to speak about their childhood? Mm -hmm. Right. OK. And actually, this brings me to something that we haven't addressed that I thought was very poignant, mm -hmm. is the linguistic part. Right. Mm -hmm. Because actually, the, the closest and most poignant memories are memories of foods mm -hmm. and memories of the language. Mm -hmm. yes. The expressions that how they call their parents, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how they um, I think of the woman who who eats the apricot <laughs> face and <laughs> speaks mm -hmm. like yeah. that, puts in Arabic yeah. terms. And that's something that as I said, although my childhood was different, I totally share with yeah. them including all the Arabic that came from, from right. Turkey. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that this Mediterranean actually doesn't and mm -hmm. should not necessarily stop mm -hmm. there. I wish that it could also go in mm -hmm. other way, yeah. right. uh, Jewish or not. We also have Jewish stories incredible mm -hmm. right. from the Balkans that yeah. we're right. not there, but anyway. Right. So right. I think the language is something that feels me Makes me feel more included mm -hmm. than more right. inclusive, whatever. Right, or right. This um, the multilingual mm -hmm. attachment to many languages. Right. Yeah. That was something that, as as scholars of language, mm -hmm. uh, I mean. yeah. There'd be a lot of, there's a lot to respond to what you said, and this is also perfect setups for some passages we wanted to read. But just to say right. quickly, and, and the language factor is obviously critically important and shouldn't go without saying. Um, and I think that also plays into Sarah's question. I mean, these individuals were all schooled in French language schools, uh, French schools, schools with a certain idea mm -hmm. of what it means to be French. And I think that produces undoubtedly. Um, uh, I don't want to essentialize, but it produces a kind of style, it produces a kind of attitude, it produces a kind of philosophical positioning that I don't think we would find if we were talking about Jewish childhoods from uh, South America or, or elsewhere, or uh, the Balkan region. Um, that's one thing. So <coughs> Turkey is really bothersome in this volume, I find, um, because of really the, the limited way in which um, in which uh, the French influence was felt, but also because of the four pieces that we have in the volume. The truth is two of them were originally written in English and translated into French for Sebar's volume. And so that also speaks, I think, quite loudly about the, the role and sort of perennity of the French language, even though we know it was a language spoken by sort of a cosmopolitan elite, not just Jews in, uh, in Turkey. So both in terms of language, both in terms of where it sits geographically, both in terms of, um, of culture and its relationship to French imperialism, it's a kind of, it's a funny creature in, in, this, uh, in, this, in this collection. Um, I sorry. was going to, Malina, you made me wonder what, what Sebar, what, what she wrote, mm -hmm. kind of how did she sell this or you know, mm -hmm. ask people, what was her ask to the writers? Because you have in here, you know, one story by a Turkish, mm -hmm. called, you know, a non-Jewish Turkish Jew. Mm -hmm. And then you have, um, again, Ms. Gish, who mm -hmm. writes, like, how can I tell you, I can't talk about a Jewish really? childhood. Like, really? I, so, so there's a certain, you know, I wonder in terms of the framing of how she approached the authors, mm -hmm. um, because some of them, you get the impression that they're, you know, very aware of what it means to be Jewish and being Jewish. And then for others, like, you know, wanting to go to Ahmed's synagogue, <sighs> it's less, Right. Like tangibly present. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so more than one author yeah. uses a line that's almost the same throughout. Like my, my Jewish childhood wasn't very Jewish, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. And they all, oh, not not all, a lot of them go to food. Yeah. They prefer to yes. talk about food mm -hmm. over anything else. And in fact, you brought up the apricot paste passage, which is just 
delicious. Um, but the, the long descriptions of food and of learning to cook and of the, um, of the ingredients, mm -hmm. um, th that seems to be a real, and it's also articulated as a common bond across communities mm -hmm. um, as well, something as people share. Mm -hmm. So potent. I think we have time for one more question and then probably we can just mill about and talk. Right, so go ahead. Yes, yeah, so thank you for this wonderful conversation. Um, I wanted to come back to the question of humor, which you brought up and then you brilliantly illustrated the letter <laughs> when you read out mm -hmm. uh, one of those passages. Um, I'm thinking about, on one hand, sort of the layers of humor that mm -hmm. we find in these stories in terms of the, uh, the eye of the retrospective eye, the, mm -hmm. the historical layers, or the humor mm -hmm. uh, or the funniness that the mm -hmm. child could, mm -hmm. could be seeing or producing mm -hmm. uh, at the time, and so how, what that historical diversity, uh, uh, how it comes out in the stories. And then also the challenge for you as translators. Mm -hmm. um, did you find that there were challenges in translating the sort of subtlety mm -hmm. of a humor, which I imagine often times would Search to defuse something mm -hmm. or refuse something, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in a, in a subtle, nuanced way, and if there are difficulties in translating that. Mm -hmm. um. I have one memory that comes to mind that maybe was just a, a humorous moment during the process, but there was a point where one of the drafts of the translation we had was translating some bad words. <laughs> and I didn't feel, like I felt like the English that had been put didn't quite Imagine. give enough zest didn't for badness. what the French was. So she turned to me. So I write, you know, again, a note for my, you know, my then advisor in the Google Doc, like, I think we need a more sassy word here. Um, but, you know, so then kind of that, that was one moment where I remember thinking, like, this is a, mm -hmm. it's a rather strange thing to be writing about. But I, I it was important to do because I had to render kind of this like, you know, curse word to get the moment across in the right way. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you remember that one, but mm -hmm. no. <laughs> I will not say it on the show. I mean, humor is notoriously yeah. very, very difficult to translate, but. Um, I don't, I don't, there, there were obviously there were challenges in, in the translations, but I don't remember them being situated in the humorous sections. Um, what's harder is uh, the the moments where there's there are plays on words, right, mm -hmm. in French or Arabic. Like the rhyming insult. Right, the <laughs> rhyming insult, which you just can't render. Um, uh, Roger Dadoun's piece, which is I th which was one of the hardest to translate, but also I think one of the most beautiful and poetic. He's an Algerian writer. Um, he's from Oran, and he he plays on the French pronunciation of Oran and also the um, the Arabic pronunciation of the city, which is Wahan. And he um, he talks about the Wah and how it sounds like a dog's bark. And so there's like an animal onomatopoeia. It's it just I mean, we lost on that one, I think, a little bit because there's just no way to change the place names. Um, but it's it's a really beautiful meditation on, on the sound of that city, the sound of that city's name, um, and, and the dog part is actually it's charming. It's not 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 insulting. Um, but his with various sort of plays on words was one of the harder ones to to deal with that I remember. Um, I well, you pointed this out in the introduction, but that one I remember. I think I made it halfway through one of the translations and then. <coughs> So like Leah, we, I help. This is was really hard. And then when I was reading the introduction, mm -hmm. you pointed out he never uses the personal pronoun je. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole essay about his childhood that is written mm -hmm. without the use of yeah. the first. So that made me feel a little bit better about the difficulty I was having because mm -hmm. it was quite. It's very it's very elliptical it's, sort of yeah. abstract text. It's very beautiful. It's also very rooted in Algiers as a city. Mm -hmm. It talks about the various sort of. Um, the various views you have, sort of looking down one sort of flank of the city versus another. Um, it's it's really, I think, a tremendous piece, very very clever and very rich, but really hard to to work with. Yeah. Well, with that question of the translatable and untranslatable, I think we can wrap up. But thank you so much for sharing. Thank this you. With you.